What you see here is the output space of a neural network. This is a way to visualize all the inputs and outputs possible for a particular net. And you can learn quite a lot about how the network architecture changes it, what activation functions to use, and more just by looking at these images. Before getting into the explanation, I would like to say that this is sort of a summary video for a bigger project that I made in which I tried making these networks generate actual images instead of just cool patterns. And this is how they are generated. First, what do I mean by output space? Basically, it is all the pairs of possible inputs and outputs for some neural network, ideally with some sort of visualization. The easiest way to get such a thing is to create a neural network that takes in one number and returns one. Then we write a list of numbers in order, from let's say negative 10 to positive 10. Then we can run the network over the list of numbers and save its outputs. And finally, we can plot those two lines like so. In this case, the x-axis is the numbers from negative 10 to positive 10, and the y-axis is what the network thinks of those numbers. Of course, we don't have to limit ourselves to 1D. If we generate a grid of x and y coordinate pairs, instead of just a line, and we pass it to a network that takes in two numbers, x and y coordinates, and returns one number, which can be interpreted as brightness, we can generate an image with what the network thinks is the brightness value for each pixel. We can also make images colorful. By making the network return three numbers instead of one, we can think of them as RGB values and update each pixel accordingly. A very cool side effect of that is that you can have infinite resolution just by adding more and more coordinates while keeping the start and end points the same. You can also zoom in and out infinitely if you for example start the coordinates from negative 0.5 negative 0.5 and end it on positive 0.5 positive 0.5 then you will have 2x zoom. And lastly, you can move up, down, left and right infinitely too. If you add some value to all y coordinates at the same time, you will move the camera up by that value. This method is what I decided to use for this video. The first thing that I decided to explore is how the length of the neural network impacts its output space. For this, I started by testing how it will look like for a thin and short network without any activation functions. The images that it generated just look like blurry lines that occasionally intersect and create a new color. Zooming out revealed more of this pattern. Then I made the network longer, and this made the lines that it drew have sharper borders. Making the network wide had the same effect. We can get more interesting results by adding activation functions. So after that I ran some tests with different activation functions, all on this exact architecture. First, I tried seeing what will happen if I use ReLU on all the layers, and got these blob looking things. They have pretty sharp borders, and another interesting thing that happens there is that when two blobs of different colors overlap, they create a new color in between. Also for some reason, the colors on the ReLU examples are pretty limited. The blobs themselves are either perfect red, green or blue, or a mix of two of those at a double intersection, or white at a triple intersection. Then I tried replacing ReLU with Sigmoid, and this created very slight gradients. I had to zoom out 10x just to see them. It's worth noting that the colors mix in the Sigmoid example far better than the ReLU one, but the image is very blurry. Danage looks like both of them combined. 
It still has a little bit of smoothness, but there are very well defined color areas that don't mix as well as the Sigmoid ones did. So not many new colors were created, but still better than the Relo ones. After testing out different activation functions, I found that the prettiest images happened when all the layers were on Tanage, but the last layer was on Sigmoid to smooth out the colors better. Then I decided to test again how length and width impact the networks, this time with the activation functions. So I generated an even more exaggerated version of the long network, applied those activation functions, and here are the results. The colors in these images are very well mixed. I can't tell at all any color zones apart, and the patterns look very complex. It's also interesting that the network can differentiate between values far above 1 and far below negative 1, which is usually used as the normalization range. Then I tried doing another exaggerated version of the short and wide network. This one is generating images that have way clearer blobs and with simpler, less blended colors. It does have quite a high level of detail. While testing the different activation functions, I wanted to see what would happen if I use absolute value as one. First, it generated these very thin circular patterns. To make them thicker, I subtracted 10 from each layer and zoomed out a hundred times. This revealed that the patterns are actually symmetric. Now this most likely happens because the absolute value makes it so the negative coordinates of the image are treated the same as the positive ones. And the imperfections in the symmetry are explained by the first layer getting the raw input before the ABS is applied to it, so it can still make irregularities. Another interesting thing is that this network can easily spot the difference between numbers like 50 and 40. Other networks of the same size but with different activation functions can barely make out the difference between 3 and 4. Here are some more cool images that I made. So what did I learn from this experiment? Number 1, activation functions let networks differentiate between numbers based on their magnitude, not only their direction. They also let networks differentiate between way higher values than just negative 1 and 1. 2, activation functions like relu and absolute value suit classifiers best. They create sharp borders that let the network transition between classes fast with high confidence. Whereas more gentle activation function combinations like Sigmoid and Tanage will make way better regression models. Their output space looks smoother. Number 3. Making models short and wide gives them more detailed patterns with sharper borders and simpler colors meaning it's good for classifiers. Making them longer makes the patterns way more complex, to the point where it's impossible to see where color borders are, and the colors are way more well mixed, so it's better for tasks that require very complex patterns and smooth switches, like regression or language models. Thank you for watching till the end, all the project files are in the description.